speaking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You may be seated. Good morning. Greetings in Christ's name. It's really good to be here after not being present for a couple of weeks. Lowell Fitzsimmons a basketball coach was frustrated with the way that his team was going. Before one game, he tried to motivate his team with a speech that centered around the word pretend. His speech went like this. Gentlemen, when you go out there tonight, instead of remembering that you're in last place, pretend that you're in first place. Instead of being in the losing streak, streak pretend that we're in this winning streak. Instead of this being a regular game, pretend this is a playoff game. With that, the team went out and were beaten by the Boston Celtics. Coach Fitz, Fitzsimmons was upset about the loss, but one of his players tried to cheer him up, saying, cheer up, cheer up, coach, pretend that we won. There's a lot of pretending in our world today, even in the church. People are trying to make it look like they really love the Lord, even through their acts of service. But they're only putting up a front. They are hiding behind a mask. They are pretending to be someone that they're not. How will we get around with all this pretending? How will God make it all right? How will he correct it? The Bible says... It is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. It will be done through judgment. Someday we will all be judged for our actions. This morning I want to talk about the judgment seat of Christ and the rewards of the believer. I will be talking a little bit, a little about some of the other judgments that will happen that we see in Scripture so that we can understand some of the differences between the judgments. The judgment seat of Christ. Some questions that of the judgment or about judgment that I want to answer this morning. What does it mean when we talk about judgment? How many different judgments are there in Scripture about and even in the future? And when will these judgments happen? And where will these judgments take place? And who will be the judge? And how will, will we be judged? And what is the purpose of the judgment? And how should we prepare for judgment? So what does judgment mean? It is predicted many times in Scripture. 
And one of those times, Psalms 96, 13, before, before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, he shall judge the world with, righteous, with righteousness and the people with his truth. There are a couple different meanings of judgment in the Bible because judgment happens at different times for mankind now and also in the future. One definition that we see, it means a separating between the godly and the ungodly. It also means, it, it means coming to a decision based on the faults or shortcomings of others. And we see that in Matthew 7, where in, when it says that we're, people are checking out and condemning the beam that is in our brother's eye, but disregard the speck in my own eye. It also means receiving a reward. We often get confused that judgment only means condemning those that have done wrong. But it also means for us as believers that it's being rewarded for the deeds that have been done on the earth. It is getting what we deserve. Major judgments that we see in Scripture. And I want to go through each one of them and describe a little bit of each one. The first judgment that we see is the judgment of the believer's sins in the cross of Christ. And actually, it could be the, I should maybe change that to, to the sin of the whole world in the cross of Christ. John 12, 31, 32, it says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This is a judgment on sin. It is where sin is taken care of. The result of sin, which is death. It is where the penalty of sin is paid. This judgment took place, of course, at Calvary when Jesus died on the cross. And the result um, that followed after this judgment is that we, as believers, can have eternal life. Actually, all those that believe can have eternal life. Another judgment that we see in Scripture is believers' self-judgment throughout life. 1 Corinthians 11, 31 and 32, it says, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be condemned with the world. This is happening when the believers are walking the light of God and his word and recognize the sin in their life. This is an event that happens every day as we walk with Christ. We see areas in our life that needs to be changed, and we make that right. We are living in obedience to God's word. And the result is chastisement or approval from God. Another judgment that we see in Scripture is the judgment of Israel for her many centuries of rebellion. This will happen in the future during the Great Tribulation. And we can read about this in Ezekiel 20, and I'm not going to take the time to read it, but uh, give a little bit of description of what it says. It says that God will purge out the rebel Jews, and that he will restore the Jews unto himself. Also that God will bring out the Jews that are scattered throughout all the world. And we see that today. The Jews are scattered throughout the whole world. And he will bring them to the land of Israel. And the result of this judgment is salvation for the Jews. And this will happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Another judgment that we see is the judgment of angels for their rebellion against God. 2 Peter 2, 4 says, For God spared not the angels as sin, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to, re to be reserved unto judgment. These are the fallen angels. And this will happen at the great white throne judgment. And this will be based on their obedience to God. And result of this judgment, the fallen angels will spend eternity in the lake of fire. And the next judgment that we see is the believer's works. And I'm not going to go into this now. I will in a little later. Another judgment that we see is the judgment of living nations at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we can see this at the end of Matthew 25, where Jesus separates the sheep from the goat. This happens when Jesus comes in all his glory, as we see in Matthew 25, 31. And when does Jesus come in all his glory? That is at the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ. This judgment is based on their obedience to God 
and also how they treated Israel during the seven year tribulation. This is the judgment of the Gentile nations. And the result of this judgment, the sheep will be with Jesus during the 1,000 year reign, while the goat will be in everlasting punishment. And the last judgment that we see in Scripture is the judgment of the wicked dead. And we see that in Revelation 20. And this will happen at the end of the 1,000 year reign of Christ. This is also considered the great white throne judgment we know so well about. But only the unbelievers will be present at this judgment. The believers will not be present there because they will be already judged. This judgment is based on the unbelievers' works and deeds done here on this earth. God and Jesus will be the judge at this place. And the result of this judgment, the unbelievers will be sent to the lake of fire. And if we go back through and look at these judgments, all these judgments are judgments on sin, except for one. And that is the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is about receiving rewards. And when we think about the judgment seat of Christ, there is often many confusions that go with it. Some people have this wrong view of the judgment as Christians that when we get to heaven, Jesus is there to weigh the good versus the bad that we have done. If we did enough good, well, in our lives, Jesus will then allow us to enter into heaven. But we know that this is false doctrine. When we became saved, when we are born again, we are on our way to heaven. When we are raptured, our bodies are already changed to live forever in heaven before we even reach the judgment seat of Christ. Another confusion that people have is some people believe that the judgment seat of Christ is for the purpose of giving account of all sins that a believer commits after he becomes a Christian. And I don't think this is right either because the Bible says that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no sentence at all. Question to ask for you. How many of my sins were paid for on the cross after I became a Christian? Or, sorry, back up. Before I became a Christian. All of them, right? What about after I became a Christian? All of them. I told you at the judgment, the judgment on the cross that Jesus paid for the the sins of the whole world. And when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for my sins and also that God remembers them no more. In Hebrews 8, 12, it says, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And also in Isaiah 38, 17, it says that God has cast all my sins behind my back. Now, when you try to look behind your back, that's one place that you cannot see with your eye. It's very difficult. God placed our sins behind our backs. Now, talking about the judgment seat of Christ, what is the judgment seat of Christ? What exactly is it? I said that is often called the Bema seat, and that's what it's called in the Greek. In the Bible times, it was considered a raised platform mounted by steps for their o Olympic Games. And Paul often used this description in his letters. It was a place where one made announcements, declarations, speeches, or judgments. And in this platform, often in, in the Olympic Games, often the president or empire of the arena sat. And from there, he rewarded all the contestants, and he rewarded all the winners. It is called the Bema, or the reward seat. So the judgment seat of Christ, if we think about it, is not a place of condemnation, but of reward. The judgment seat of Christ is only a place, and not a judgment seat of penalty. The judgment seat of Christ is a place of honor. When we get to heaven, there are no losers. In the Christian life, we are all winners. We will all be able to be rewarded. Every man shall have praise of God. When and where will the judgment seat of Christ happen? Revelation twenty two twelve 12, it says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work shall be. 
according as his work shall be. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, it says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. The judgment seat of Christ will happen after we have been raptured, like it says there in Revelation 22. The judgment seat of Christ will also happen in heaven. In John 14, 2 and 3, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, it says, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So it's going to be in heaven, the judgment seat of Christ. So who will be the judge? In Romans 2.16, it says that God will, shall judge the secrets of men. And then it says, by Jesus Christ. In John 5.22.27, it says, God judges no man, but has given all judgment unto Jesus. He has also given Jesus authority to execute judgment. Jesus will judge all men at some point in time. Not all at one time, but at some time, Jesus will judge all men. Who are the ones that are going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ? Only the believers will be judged. There will be no unbelievers at this judgment. Their, their time is coming yet. And I said that will be at the great white throne judgment. That will be their time. Romans 14, 10 and 12, it says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And the, the all that is speaking about is the church. All believers will be present at this judgment. There will be no exemptions. We will all have our time with Jesus. And I'm not here to say that I understand everything. There's lots to, lots to learn yet, I'm sure, even for me. Um, but this is the place of reward. You know, when we think of standing before Jesus, um, it's, we think it's a fearful thing. Um, but it's a place of reward. Another question that we can ask is, how will we judge? Believers will be judged thoroughly. Everything will be revealed. The secrets of men will be revealed. Our actions, our motives, our attitudes. Luke 8, 17. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest. Neither anything hid that shall not be made, that shall not be known and come abroad. You know, God knows everything that we do. Even the good things that we do. God knows everything good thing that we do. There may be many times that people don't notice the good things that we do, but God does. The judgment day is coming for those specific times. There's a little story on the completeness of God's judgment that I want to share. A group of children was lined up in the cafeteria of a Catholic elementary school for lunch. At the head of the table was a large pile of apples. A nun posted a note on the apple tray. Take only one. One. Remember, God is watching. Moving further along the lunch line at the other end of the table was a large pile of chocolate chip cookies. A child had written a note. Take all you want. God is watching the apples. But the truth is, God is watching the apples and the cookies. God knows all things. He observes all things. Another way that we will be judged, in 1 Peter 4, 5 to 6, it says, We are judged according to the gospel. What is the gospel? It is the good news of Jesus Christ, of salvation, and of the coming kingdom. We are judged according to the materials that we are using to build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. This is another way. And we see that in 2 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15. And why don't you turn there? I might read that. 2 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15. And for some reason, this is not right. Try 1 Corinthians. 
There we go. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 to 15. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So here we see that all believers are building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. The question that we need to ask ourselves, what materials are we using? Some of us are using gold. Some of us are using silver. Some of us are using precious stones. And some of us are using wood, hay, and stubble, in which is a stalk left after the ears are cut off. What is the difference between these, these materials? We see that all these materials will go through fire, but not all will burn. We are being judged by our works, the things that we do to build up the foundation of Jesus Christ. Some of our works will be destroyed, just like fire destroys wood, hay, and stubble. So what are some of these works that you are doing that will last? And we need to ask ourselves, what are some of these works? Is what you are involved in going to affect the life of someone for eternity? And I think that the difference between these two is selfishness. Am I living for myself or am I building up the church of God? Or maybe even the motives. Why do I do what I do? Is it for myself or is it purely for Jesus Christ? We need to ask God to search our hearts so that we can see, so that we can know why we do the things that we do. If we reach heaven, or I'm sorry, if our works are burned, we will still reach heaven, like it says in verse 15. We will still be saved, but we will suffer loss. And we will not have nothing to give to Jesus. A good way to know if we're using the right materials is will we, we be missed in the church, by the works, by the gifts that we give or offer when we go to be with Jesus? Are we involved in the church? Are we doing what we can to build the church? Some other ways that the Bible says that we will be judged is by doctrine. Do we cause others to stumble by what we believe? Another one is by our conduct to others. Are we a stumbling block to others? Do we treat people with kindness? Do we offend others? Another way that we will be judged is by our carnal traits. Are we living according to the spirit or to the flesh? Another way is by our words. Does our word speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak, speaketh. Is our words pure and encouraging? Another way that we are judged is by the things that affect others. Are we quick to argue? Are we dishonest? Do we break promises? Do you have wrong dealings with other people, whether in business or whatever it may be? Another way that we're judged is by things that affect us. By neglecting opportunities that come our way, by wasting the talents that God has given us, by loose living, not caring about life, not caring about the spirituality of life. Believers will be judged individually. Like I said, every believer will need to stand alone before God. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So, what is the purpose of the judgment seat of Christ? It is to give an account of ourselves to God. Romans 14, 12, it says, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. 
Account means to give an explana explanation to answer concerning one's duty, duties and conducts. There are no exceptions. Every one of us shall give an account. We need to answer to someone who's in authority over us, which is God. And this, I think, is one thing that can help us, that can motivate us to do the right thing, knowing that we need to give an account to God. It is when we need to give an account for those in authority. That's the way that I think that God made us, so we we're driven to do what is right. We can see that in a child with his parent or teacher. You know, usually in a school or in a home situation, children and the students need to give an account need to be accountable to their teachers, whether the parents are not present or the teacher. There needs to be accountability. Or even when a police officer comes around as we're driving down the road, we need to be accountable. Um, for some reason, the speed changes. We're accountable. We do what is right. We are motivated to do the right thing. The Bible tells us, and we know, that we need to give an account to God. So let's do the right thing. Let's live according to the Holy Spirit and not according to the flesh. So we don't need to suffer loss. The great American statesman Daniel Webster was once asked about the greatest thought to ever enter his mind. He responded, the most important thought that ever occupied my mind is my accountability to God. We will give an account to God of our lives. Another purpose of the judgment seat of Christ, and like I said before, is to give to every man his reward. And like I said in Revelation 22, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. The purpose of the judgment seat of Christ is to give the rewards to each one of us. So how do we prepare for this judgment day? And I want to remind you, this judgment is not about salvation, but is whether, or is not about whether we get it to heaven or not, but it's about the works that we have done here on the earth. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 27. I want to read these verses, talking about how we prepare for this judgment day. Know ye not that they which run in a race Run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may attain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible, corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. So how does Paul prepare for the judgment seat of Christ, for the Bema seat? It says he puts his flesh under subjection, he disciplines himself. He says that he, didn't, he doesn't just fight the air or beat the air, but he fights his body. He keeps under my body and brings it into subjection. And in other words, what we can say there about that is he's, he is beating his body up until it's black and blue, his flesh. He's working hard. Um, to, he's disciplining himself, his flesh, his desires um, to be kept under subjection, to keep it under control, under, to keep by, through self-denial. He, de he considers his body an enemy. And I preach on this couple, I don't know, during COVID, I preach on that, on the race and how we need to keep our flesh under self-control. He acted to keep the body as a slave to the soul, not permitting his soul to be a slave to the body. And I think there's a difference there. Are we allowing our body to be a slave to the soul and not the body, or not the soul a slave to the body? And how much did he do this? He did this constantly. It's not a once and done thing. It's constantly. Every day we need to do this. 
Another way that we can prepare for this is um, we well, found in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 to 5. If you want to turn to there, I'm going to read that. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judge of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self, for I know nothing by, mis for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. Another way that we found or that we can prepare ourselves for this day, we see in verse 2, that we are faithful, be found faithful. What does it mean to be faithful? It is trusty, being faithful. A person who show themselves faithful in, tra in the transaction of business, the execution of commands, or the discharge of official duties. Are we faithful to God and what he has called us to, whatever it may be, in the gifts that he has given us? We all have spiritual gifts. We all are good at something. Are we faithful to what God um, has given us? Are we involved in or gifts. There is an old tale about three men crossing the desert by camel at night. As they were crossing the desert, a voice came out of the darkness. The voice commanded them to dismount, pick up some pebbles, and put them in their pockets. The voice said, at the coming of the sun, you will both be glad and sorry. The travelers did as they were told, and later as the sun came up, they remembered what the voice had said. At the coming of the sun, you will be both glad and sorry. They reached into their pockets and pulled out not pebbles, but diamonds. They were both glad and sorry. Glad they took as many as they did. Sorry that they did not take more. Are we doing all that we can to prepare for this day? God has given us gifts. Are we using them? to build up the church. Now I want to look at the rewards that are given to Christians. You may be thinking of times in your life where you have slipped and failed, and you don't feel like you're adequate to receive the rewards. You feel like your motives are not right, and you've done things in the wrong attitudes or whatever. Maybe you haven't given your best in the acts of service and only did it half-heartedly. You know, maybe you had pride in your life when you did acts of service. But I believe the rewards that we get will only be because of the grace of God. And I read this verse in 1 Corinthians 4, 5. It says, Then shall every man receive the praise of God. It says, Every man shall receive the praise of God. We will all receive rewards. So what will be our reward? Our reward will be a crown, just like a crown was rewarded to the athletic runner. There are at least, there are at least five different crowns that are mentioned in the Bible. And I want to go through them. The first crown is the incorruptible crown. And I read that in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25. This crown is given to those who are, who are self-disciplined, who are being controlled by the Holy Spirit instead of the flesh. Another crown is the crown of rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians 2, 9, 19, it says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is asking as a question, are not ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? The crown of rejoicing is given to those who help people find salvation. That these people can be in the presence of Jesus. And I want to remind you that this is not just one person. It's often a team effort. Some people plant the seed. Some people offer words of encouragement and some people harvest while God gives the increase. It's a team effort. 
Another crown that we see in Scripture is the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4.8, it says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So the crown of righteousness is given to those who are longing for the return of Jesus. And when we anticipate his return, it motivates us to work for him until he comes. Another crown that we see in Scripture is the crown of life. And Revelation 2.10, it says, Fear none of the, those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. But th thou faith, but, sorry, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. This crown is given to those that have endured temptations and trials, even to the point of martyrdom. And it was because of their faith in Christ. Another crown that we see in Scripture is the crown of glory. 1 Peter 5, 1-4, it says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ruddy mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So who is this crown given to? I think it could be pastors, but also to leaders. And where do we see leaders at? We see them in the home. We see them in Sunday, Sunday school teachers, in the school teachers, uh, people that are in authority over other people, whether it's in the church or in the family. So what will we do with the, our crowns that are given us? Nate read from Revelation 4 about the 24 elders. Revelation 4.10, the, the four and twenty elders fell, fall down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, We will not keep our crowns, but we will cast them at Jesus' feet. And notice it doesn't say just some of the 24 elders, but it says, it lists, I mean, it gives all of them. The four and 24, the four, the 24 elders cast their crowns before Jesus. Why will we cast our crowns before him? We read on in Revelation 11, 4, 11, it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. It is only because of Jesus that we receive these crowns. We won't cast them at Jesus' feet because we have to, but because we will recognize our undoneness. It is only because of Jesus that we will receive these crowns. It's only because of Jesus working in our lives, in my life, that I receive the crowns. So are we doing all that we can for Jesus? Are we living according to the Holy Spirit? Or are we living according to the flesh? Are we anticipating the judgment seat of Christ? There's a little story here of a missionary couple that I want to close with. There was an old missionary couple, couple Mr. and Mrs. Henry C. Morrison, who served in Africa for 40 years and were returning to America to retire. This was in the days when most transcontinental travel was done by ship. As they steamed into New York Harbor, they had mixed feelings. Though glad to be home, they were concerned because they had no pension, their health was broken, and they were tired. They discovered while aboard ship that President Theodore Roosevelt and his entourage were also on board, returning from a big game hunting expedition in Africa. They watched the fanfare that accompanied the president as he returned from aboard. Roosevelt was met by a great delegation with much excitement. Reverend, Reverend Morrison couldn't help feeling some resentment. There was no one to meet him. 
No one came to celebrate their return after 40 years of faithful service. Honey, you shouldn't feel that way, said Mrs. Morrison. I can't help it, he said. It doesn't seem right. The missionaries slipped off the ship, unnoticed, found a cheap room on New York's east side, and tried to figure out their future. That night, the missionary's heart broke, and he said to his wife, I can't take this. God is not treating us fairly. His wife replied, Why don't you just go in the bedroom and tell that to the Lord? A short time later, Reverend Morrison came out from the bedroom, and his face was completely different. His wife asked, Honey, what happened? He said, Well, the Lord settled it with me. I told him how bitter I was that the president should receive this tremendous, tremendous homecoming when no one met us as we returned home. And when I finished, it seemed as though the Lord put his hand on my shoulder and simply said, But you're not home yet. Just remember, we are not home yet. God will judge what is right and fair. Let us kneel to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you, Lord, for the grace that you've given us and are giving us and will continue on giving us. Thank you for salvation. I pray, God, that you use God and direct us as we think about the judgment day. I pray, God, that you use search our hearts and see what for motives and attitudes that we may have, that we can make them right, and that we can serve you with a pure heart. I just pray, God, that you would be with us today. Guy and direct our fellowship. I pray that we could be a blessing and encouragement to one another. Thank you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.